and dashboard, the main things that we care about, right? We're driving down the road. This is our how fast we're going, how much gas we have in the tank. These are our key compound metrics. So, Greg, can you help me out? What are our minutes created? For this week or over? For this week. For this little week at 250. 250? Oh, we're we doing a two-week thing because no, we just had spring break. Welcome yeah. back, spring break. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this is a two. That's all right. Two fifty minutes watched. Uh, sixteen fifty-eight. Wow. All right. And that's just in the last can I, two weeks. Can I have you yeah. talk to the person who actually created the nice. Uh, nine fifty-eight. Nine hundred fifty-eight people in the last. And these are all deltas, right? Yes. Okay, so what were what are our total minutes created overall? All right, let me call you back. Total minutes created overall? Back. Uh, three, um, eight, four, five. Thank you. Three, eight, four, five. And minutes watched? Uh, uh, 21, 165. And then reach? 24, 12. That's our overall total? Yeah. All right, wow. Reach out and touch everybody. Okay. So as we look through, we can get a quick snapshot. As you remember, the whole point of this is seeing what's going on from sort of you know 20,000 feet, meaning like we're looking down, how are things going? And as we look through quickly, uh, we can see some thir certain things that really stand out to you. Um, which of these numbers kind of uh, jumps out at you? Okay, minutes watched. Why? It's a big freaking number. Again, the minutes watched is people pe number of people watching it, right? That's the number that we aggregate from YouTube and uh, Ustream when we decide to use it. All right, so that's that's a bunch, but you know, as a as a factor of the total here, you know, it's you know not that much. You know, it's less than ten percent easily. What uh, what other numbers jump out at us? Reach. Why do you say reach? Because that's a big number. What the heck happened? Um, the alumni list got updated. So as we're looking at it, and those of you who don't understand what Greg is saying, and let's say you're managing Glowsville, which we all are. It's company owned, yeah. As you're looking at this from above, something is going on here. Usually this number is like what, Greg? Six. Six. <laughs> Ten. So this is a moment of what the heck happened? And this is where this type of dashboard while useful, kind of breaks down, because it's not telling me what the heck happened. Only one or two people in this room actually know what happened. And so here's the process that I'm going to be showing you when we're looking at this, when it's time to dive into our data, which is something we should be doing on a regular basis. Not necessarily as regularly as we're looking at our overall numbers, but this is a great opportunity to say, all right, what the heck happened? So the process I'm going to lay out here is first. Um, and most embarrassing story? Um, when I walked in really late that time to class. Last time or this time? <laughs> Last time I think I was on time. So this is the most embarrassing moment that you've had totally. in the last... Forever. <laughs> Do you want to memorialize it with like a statement <laughs> to the camera? I guess not. Okay. So what are we doing? We're saying in this process, gather... Analyze. I'll stop here. Here's what we're up to. We're starting a, a process of looking at our data and how we figure out, well, what the heck happened with this reach number? And this task can be done at first by anyone can really do reporting. No offense, Greg. You're awesome. But anyone can kind of look up numbers and report, here's what happened. We went up by 900 people. So we do have to gather information. We're gathering, and we'll be talking about today, Google Analytics, looking at web traffic, Facebook, MailChimp, and Twitter, saying, where do we gather these data? And then the reporting part is kind of what Greg has been doing. On a weekly basis, we get one of those emails, and it's like, well, OK, what's going on? We get a high-level view, and it's reported out. But we don't get to this level of analyzing. right? We don't, and haven't yet, asked a question of the data. And that's the point at which we make this turn around the data process. So 
we've gathered information, and now we're going to ask questions and analyze. So at the point where we're asking questions, right, why did we increase by 958 where we normally are increasing by like 5 or 10 people? We ask questions and then we analyze. So the question is, how the heck did this happen? What is going on? You can formulate it more scientifically, but that's the gist. And we analyze. Where would we find, uh, how would we analyze that number? What would we do to find that? Uh, so you think it's something in the content? All right, so we could check content. What else could we check? Because what, what factors into this number? Remember, it's this is number of emails we have. This is the number of Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, other, other social networks. So when we're looking at why that number would go up, the most likely place to look is what are the components that make up that number? And then dive into it. And so where would you now more likely find the reason why that number went up by 958? Well, um, what if we didn't they um, send out like emails to alumni and stuff? There's something going on with alumni. I remember somebody talking about something with alumni. I know Dr. Keene, they were like doing a lot of like reaching out to like alumni and they probably emailed them or told them to like find us on Facebook or close them. Something, something happened. happened. Yeah. A thing happened. And we have to find out what that thing was. So here's our question, analyzing. So I remember something with email. Let's go take a look at our email. Where would we find those data? <laughs> well, in general in the world, Greg may not be the one who can come to your rescue, but where might we find these data, Greg? MailChimp. In MailChimp. What the heck is MailChimp? It's a chimp that throws mail at you. I can't possibly agree with you. <laughs> So MailChimp, you want to take another crack at it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a way we can, like, you can subscribe to our mailing list, and that's what we use to send out emails to mass amounts of people. Email blasts? Email, yeah. Program. Blasting emails. Mm -hmm. Phrasing. Mm -hmm. Words. Things, items. So when we look in... Globesville campaigns. I'm trying to get an overview that will give it to us. We look at our lists. Mailchimp is allowing us to. There we go. Send large amounts of emails out to people. And in this case, our people. I'm trying to get our stats to overview. We can go in. Nice animation. Hmm. It's a nice animation they have there. Who? Sound effect. So we're able to go into something like MailChimp, which allows us to send out, you know, once you get inside of Gmail and you're trying to send out like hundreds of emails, you realize very quickly, oh god, this is a terrible idea. I regret this immediately. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. The time will come when you two will make that mistake. And you'll realize, how do I send out a whole bunch of emails? And you'll come across uh, programs like MailChimp, which is actually free up to 2,000 emails. So it's a really good tool to use if you're trying to build up a small audience. And again, we're collecting these emails so we can send out large messaging campaigns to say, hey, go watch our video, go do this thing. Inside of MailChimp, it has our list growth. And we have something that's like fairly stagnant over time. And what is the primary way that our list grows in the past? How do people get on our mailing list? By us threatening them. They sign up on our, exactly. They come to our website and say, oh, this looks interesting. What a funny video. It reminds me of the day when sign up email. However, we've got this absurd and uh, absurd bit of bump here where we're going from like, you know, a couple up and down to all of a sudden we jump up by like almost 900, <laughs> 900 new emails. So in this point, we can say, oh, what happened here? And then track down, yes. In fact, last week, a couple weeks ago, they found a whole bunch of new alumni, and they actually went through NYT and imported them. So if you wonder why a bunch of your friends are about to get emails, this is why. Well, not yet. They haven't sent it out. They're going to send it out. That, by the way, is an NYT alumni. Awesome. Thank you for coming back. OK. So this is what happened. We get it. All right, we tracked down why that number went up through the roof. 
and now we've analyzed it. So what? Many people would stop here and be like, all right, job well done. Awesome. Let's go on and eat some munchkins, which, by the way, you're welcome to have. Pass them around. <laughs> Not you, Mark. Really? Hit and run. Okay. So you have to put all the emails into this chip plugin? Yes, you have to feed the chimp mail. (laughs) Feed him emails. Feed the monkey emails. Feed him emails. So we've analyzed it. We figured out what happened. But what about an insight or two? What is the difference between analyzing something and gaining an insight from it? What do you guys think? Isn't it? Isn't it just the same thing? We've analyzed it. Is this just me playing with extra words, which I am want to do? We've got an idea that how people got so attracted to it, so now it's you. You've got an idea what to do in the future, what changes to make. You know? Exactly. We're getting, you said a key word, future. What the heck should we do in the future? How do we do more of what works? And as we get from analysis and analyzing something into action, I'll spell action, right? We come across this insight. One of the fastest ways to grow is to go around and grab a whole bunch of alumni and throw them into our list. It made up a key number increase. We'll see how uh, this performs once we send messages to them. But where else can we find these? This is the fastest way to grow for now. And so the insight is, heck, we can improve by one or two each week, or we can go and track down maybe alumni databases that other schools and clubs have and offer the service to them. We can look at sports teams. By the way, I'd be surprised if there wasn't like a soccer team somewhere. There's no rules when we're really trying to think about what we're trying to do here. Get out the message of what Glovesville is sharing stories of the uh, NYIT experience and news. It's like pretty much, I'd say there's not a single person who's graduated school that wouldn't get some sort of value out of, oh my gosh, I remember that time and the students and have some fun with it. So this insight is that there are more than just like one database. This was only looking inside our own department. How could we look outside of this? And the action could be, all right, let's go track down some more alumni databases. This is just playing this through, which then leads us back to gathering again. What was the true value of adding this little extra bump? And you know, um, email God's willing, we will send a message to these folks and be able to go around the circle again. What was the value of it? And what do you think would be something of value? How would we measure value out of that? Did we already do it? Is it like job done? What do you think? It saves lots of minutes. Saves lots of time. Right? It only matters if they watch content. If they just sit there as an email on a list, then it'll be like, well, that wasn't that useful. It's kind of cool to have now like 2,400 people we can talk to. And so how are we going to measure that? If we watch the growth in, in minutes lost from before they subscribed. Mm-hmm. So that's the outcome that we're looking for. We're trying to get to this. We want them to watch minutes. Would we be able to, say, pull up YouTube and say, oh, I can see that so-and-so's email address watched 10 minutes of this? Would we be able to look at something like that? You mean see like a specific viewer who watched? Mm-hmm. You could do that. I don't know. I you can't. It's that, it hasn't gotten that creepy. We can get aggregate demographic tools, but we can't. So you're trying to, we're trying to make this jump. And so how would you figure out if, say, lucky number 872, the 872nd email that we added to this list, how would we figure out if that was any good or not? Which data? Where would we gather that information first off? We'd be in MailChimp. And so inside of MailChimp, we'd have to figure out, did they open and click? on anything. Right, that's that first step. They're not going to go watch something out of nowhere. And so hopefully we'll put some sort of video in there. They'll click on it and we'll be able to tell that by looking at the individual report for MailChimp. And that's where we get into these campaigns. When we send out a message, we actually get a pretty robust bit of data back. Here's a report. So we're jumping in and just saying, Next week, hypothetically, we're going to send out a message. We'll see here's the total recipients, total people that received it, when it was sent, obviously, and then we get an open rate. What is an open rate? How many people opened it? 
and click rate, click through rate. <coughs> what do you think that is? <coughs> Number of people that clicked on something inside of that email. All those links are tracked and we can tell. So if somebody clicks on it, goes to the video, we'll be able to tell, all right, they clicked on it and they probably watched. And then we'd be looking at watched in aggregate and see like, oh, there was a spike in that type of video because on that day we sent that email. And we can track that down and see how it did. Does that make sense? You have to measure that interim step to judge the value of that. So next week, we're going to be hopefully sending an email that we can then look at the open rate and click through rate. And we'll play a game of what we think those data are. Any questions? What's going to be in the email? Like, what, what video are you taking? Naked sexy girls .com. Nope. Not, not OK. Not OK. <laughs> not a real site either. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so which email, and we realized we were wielding a lot of power. Um, right now it's an introductory email to Globesville, and it will have how to create a Global Minute so people can send us their, their info. We can play around with the messaging of future emails. So this is the, the data process. Any other questions on this? And this is the difference of, in this process, this is, some, this is the work of an analyst, and this is just a reporter. This is a, a, a reporting squirrel, as cool. Avinash Koshek likes to call it. And that's just the job of saying, hey, here's the information, but don't necessarily dive into it. One of the biggest and fastest growing sectors, when you look on LinkedIn right now, is actually this data analyst role. The ability to go through this process and come back with actionable insights is what is going to be making sense of big data, a term that you've heard, I'm sure. Have you heard of the term big data? Here and there. Here and there. Donnie, what's, what is big data? It's I feel like, like you never get to participate. Well, it's like all the data that your, your company or your department uh, basically uh, gathers. And, um, and that means all of it, not just a little piece of like this over here, and I'm analyzing this little piece that we're talking about here. That's all the data and making sense of all the data and how it's intertwined with everything else that happens in your department or company. Exactly. Big data is the overarching term for every single piece of information stored on either you, your actions, the, the larger sphere of activity around your stakeholders. It's a whole bunch of numbers that is only continuing to grow. And it literally, the amount of information stored on you today would take you a lifetime to really dig through. I mean, we're going down into the minutiae of, yeah, there's certainly cameras. You were swiping something. You went through an easy pass. You went on several websites uh, during the day. You open your mobile phone. It's in text messages. You kind of get it. There's a lot of information out there. So this process is something that companies are really starting to, to prize in a, in a data analyst, somebody who's able to make sense and tell stories and actionable insights from all of these sources of data. We just covered MailChimp. And I would like to move on to an overview of Google Analytics. But first, I have to explain why I love Google Analytics. I thought that you were going to um, sing praises for me and Donnie because it's a GA love. Yeah, but, it's not really uh, GA, no. No, it's not. I don't, you know, I don't feel so good about this next Yeah, it was misleading. It is misleading. Down. You guys are amazing, though. Yeah, keep uh, lying to us, see what happens. Yeah, I know. That's not what he says to us in private, by the way. <laughs> Alrighty, so I have a very geeky joke up here. That's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, You're going to have to dig them up to find out. Yeah, <laughs> well, he may or may not be there. Okay, so anybody familiar with uh, Heisenberg? Um, not just the character on Breaking Bad. No, I, I've never seen Breaking Anyone Bad. Anyone familiar with the character on Breaking Bad? Anyone here watch Breaking Bad? Me? <laughs> really? Yeah. That's terrible. I know, I know Heisenberg and the uncertainty okay. principle. So those of you who don't watch Breaking Bad, you should. That's a great way to spend spring break. And anyway, it's about a scientist who figured out, among other things in this case, uh, the principle of uncertainty. And it's the Heisenberg's principle of uncertainty that says, um, the act of observation affects the observed. So if I were trying to find the exact position and speed of a particle, it is technically impossible because as I observe it, the light that has already hit it means it has already moved from where it was. It's a really sort of heady term, but it's a fundamental behind this 
again, active observation affecting the observed. So for example, if I'm like staring at you right now, what are the chances that you know, you're going to go to sleep? Higher than that. Low, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Low, lower? <laughs> I can go to sleep, trust me. And you ask Eric, trust me. Nah. You asked the wrong person. I perhaps <laughs> asked the wrong person. Thank you, though. If I was, let's say, asking you to grade me on how I'm doing right now, how, how, you know, how great a professor am I, um, everyone like write on a piece of paper right now, and I won't look, um, how do you think I'm doing on a scale of 1 to 100? 100 is good, 1 is not so good. Go can, on, we, can we put negative on. numbers? Oh, that's really, <laughs> really right. You actually have to write down a freaking number. I'm not looking. Irrational numbers, <laughs> like <laughs> radical two. <laughs> can we just hold up our hands? <laughs> no? no one has any paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What is New, New York Institute of Technology. No uh, one has any paper. Okay. Um, now I want you to. Um, let's see, who, who can I use as a guinea pig? No, no. I am. You've covered the number, hopefully. No, I didn't write it. Cover, <laughs> Cover your number. All right. Now I want you to write, again, a number right here. Any number? No, I want you to judge me again. How am I doing as a professor? You're going to look at it? From, yeah, I'm watching you write this number. <laughs> How am I doing? <laughs> OK. So you've written down 100. Um, can I see the original number? Oh, damn it. <laughs> it's the same. Of course it's the same. OK. The act of observation, I'm, I'm willing to bet, <laughs> I'm willing to bet that the act of observation, if I were to look at everybody's number and I get you to do that, would be slightly higher if I were watching over your shoulder on how you're doing. All right, I, you've, you've wrecked me at every turn to prove this. I have one last attempt. Uh, the last time, uh, let's say, last time you went to the doctor and they asked you, how many drinks do you normally have in a week? Did you answer honestly? <laughs> I heard some laughs. This, nobody, this right answers, nobody answers honestly. Okay? And why don't you answer honestly? I don't want to be judged. So I say an answer that I'm like, what is a normal human normal? Socially, is it? I drink uh, once every two weeks. The act of observation affects the observed. This happens when we're trying to do sort of like research. Would you like to, you know, buy this product if we create it, wouldn't you like this product? And you're like, yeah, sure, yeah, of course. Don't you like this show? And it's a lot of, um, a lot of problems that arise from this sort of you know, anecdotal, uh, meaning people tell you what they like while you're observing them, uh, to sort of like please the observer. What I love about Google Analytics, and by the way, the sort of Facebook and Twitter and MailChimp analytics, is that there's no sort of act of the ob observation effect. There's no um, observer effect because it simply tells you what people actually look at. And so if people are, in fact, only liking things when we post you know, funny fizz photos instead of like heartbreaking news, we can see that. If people are only going to the like, Kesha videos on YouTube, we can see that. And it's not, wouldn't you like hard hitting news from the NYIT angle? Sure I would. What do they actually look at? Pop goes the culture. So we're a little bit at odds, but we can actually find these data, the actual answers of what people are, in fact, looking at instead of what we think they are or what they tell us when they're trying to please us. So this is at the heart of it, why I love the ability to find all of this information. Let's go through some Facebook analytics really quickly. And here, who has uh, ever logged into Facebook Insights? Who knows what Facebook Insights are? OK. What the heck are Facebook Insights, Greg? I'm not going to be a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I, I can make it's things difficult, question sir. again. <laughs> I can make things difficult for you. Um, it tracks our likes, um, how people are engaged, our posts, what people, how far the posts reach to people, um, the engagement for each post. Like if you click on a, the last post, you can see eight, it reached eight people and who liked it and who shared it and everything. All of these data available for every single time we make another little post about, you know, a cat crossing the road. There's a whole bunch of analytics behind that. The reach, the likes, the comments, the shares. Facebook is tracking all of this for us because on one side of the coin, they want us to create better content, and they do that by showing us the data. And the other side is they have these handy little, hey, go buy more likes so you can make these numbers go up, sort of stupid human tricks. And that is a large, the, 
USD, sorry, part of their revenue. And so you see this down here on the right where it's like boost posts, so you can potentially increase these reach and engagement numbers. Even without advertising, um, and that is usually the big driver of this. Sorry, I'll stop blocking it. Even without advertising, we still get um, elements of this engagement number. So we can see a combination of likes, comments, and shares, which is the proxy for engagement. Are you actually engaged? In this room, I can measure engagement by are you sleeping or not? I'm like, OK, or eye contact, OK. When we're online, this is kind of like those indicators. If somebody likes a thing, I'll go. They engage with it as opposed to like they fell asleep while watching this because they were actually watching Breaking Bad, which none of you do. <laughs> it's not homework. It's just a good show. So we can go through and actually see the type of posts that do better than others. And without going too far into it, um, as a general rule, this post reach is kind of a fluff and stuff number. It really is a vanity metric and a number out there to like impress advertisers or you know that big hairy number like we reached 10,000 people and they did nothing. <laughs> it only matters when people engage with you. We can go into likes and get an actual tracking of what's going on with people, likes, unlikes, where people came from. I'm not going to go too deep into these only because I'm just trying to <coughs> you with some of the obscene amount of information that it gives you. And again, you realize there's so much more than just the like total likes and people talking about those numbers inside of Facebook. And using this process, putting on your resume, like a social analyst actually will go into these data. We'll actually create a report of here are the top five posts and why we can do more of this. And by the way, if we were to analyze our data, spoiler alert, on Facebook, what works? Photos. The the net result of analyzing this information for now would be photos. But what kind of photos? More often than not are uh, overlaying inspirational quotes over photos that are uploaded to Facebook and hosted actually on Facebook. Juxtaposed with the right messaging and time of day, you begin to get into something that is going to definitely help a content team. And so I would push our current social team to say, well, what kind of posts are performing well? And how can we look at our data to increase that? Going through this process of not just analyzing, asking the question, what posts work? What time of day works? What, um, what day of the week? And in fact, realizing that there is uh, a lot of uh, cyclicality of the, of the week where you have ebbs and flows of when it's a better time to post and when not to. Any questions on Facebook Insights, or you want me to dive deeper into any of these pieces? OK. Next up, Twitter analytics. Every, I have a question. Uh, the best time to post on Facebook is a very unsatisfying answer, but it depends. It depends on the audience you're trying to reach. For example, if you're trying to reach a younger audience, more often than not, actually, Sunday and Sunday night when people are procrastinating and not doing their homework, none of you, of course, I can tell you. people are actually very, uh, especially high schoolers, are very active uh, on Facebook. Um, times of day, you know, you can look at um, usually in, uh, in midday bumps, but you'll actually find those answers inside of our own analytics and seeing when people are, uh, are active. I could tell you. On yeah. Sunday, the, on, on Sunday and Thursday are the most active when people that like go up those. OK, there you go. And that may be due partially because why do you think, why do you think Thursday is on there? Thursday. We're freaking here Thursday. We're impacting <laughs> our own data. We Lots of things going on. Size. Sunday was a, you know, a blind industry guess, but that is happened to be right. Good question, though. And like looking at benchmarks outside of it, you're like, oh, what should we perform? Because you realize we may have a small, skewed sample size. Well, I just feel like we, it's not that we post that much stuff on Facebook anyway. So to say, like, let's say it goes through someone's news feed, and then it's later on in the day, that's really not, I don't know, I feel like it's not accurate, because then it just gets lost. So Yeah, so there are so times. we're posting like every hour to figure out what's really working. I feel like, how do you know? You can post three to five times a day with similar type of uh, messaging and takes on different links and cool things you find, like whaling videos and whatnot. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, like and then you can see, yeah, after like a net result <laughs> of a week, what's been working. And then you can say, well, heck, it seems like the mornings are doing a bit better. Yeah. Let's get a couple more posts in the morning. And then like, forget it. Like Nobody's looking at their thing during you know, uh, sure you know, recess time, whatever you kids do. <laughs> I had to. 
Um, on Twitter, <coughs> unless there are any other questions on Facebook and uh, Facebook Insights. Cool. Facebook. Uh, now we move to Twitter, and again, what we're looking for is that magic word engagement. Again, in this room. You're making eye contact with me. I totally get it. The camera's making eye contact with me. You're obviously engaged right now. Slash, I'd have to look at the analytics. We're looking for engagement. And on Twitter, this is, actually, I'm not going to give it away. What would count as engagement? If I just tweet something out, how can I tell if people are making eye contact with me online? If they retweet it. What's a retweet? Basically, post, like reposting whatever that last person posted onto there. Yeah. yeah. So it's like they had some interaction. Oh my gosh, you didn't just passively let this wash over you like a cold rain. Like a conversation. OK, so retweet. Anything else? Mentions. Mentions. What does it mention? When they actually tweet at the page. Right, they tweet at your account. Anything else? Favorites. Favorites. What's a favorite? Is that the star? That's a little star thing. You press the little star and it like goes up. I favorited this. I, I, I don't understand it really, other than like I favor things. I'm like, that's great. It's like my meta way of saying, I don't want to retweet it, but I want to give you a nod. It's just like liking it on Facebook. Yeah, I think that's a good proxy. That's exactly what it, it is. Thank you. I'm going to steal that for next time. Edit that out. Oh, that's mine. Guys, it's actually like a, so the star is like a Facebook like. Uh, it's, it's similar. I did a lot of research on it. OK. Um, so we have in here favorites, retweets, replies, and we're getting the same type of engagement metrics for our tweets. There are third-party platforms that can do this for us, but Twitter is now offering this when you go to analytics.twitter.com and set that up. They're, unsurprisingly, kind of following in the footsteps of Facebook with this because they realize when they put the numbers in front of you, what do we as humans want to do? We want to make those numbers go up, and so we are more likely to advertise when we can see the data behind it. It's what we've come to expect. If I'm spending dollar one on this site, I better see some engagement, I better see some reach, I better see something I can tell my boss. And so this is um, going to become a lot more robust um, in the coming, uh, I'd say coming months on analytics.twitter. Questions for Twitter? Makes sense? tracking things, our analytics team, our social team realizes that, oh, we can look at the same way. What are the best types of posts? Time of day, same type of questions, because our ultimate goal is to increase our engagement. OK. We talked about, um, I talked about YouTube analytics uh, in the past, but what are some of the ways we can tell what, oh, let me see if I get it. What are the main things we're looking for when we look at something like Kesha's toothpaste and Brittany's odor? Video. How do we tell if somebody is engaging with our video? What analytics are we looking at? Views. Views. Okay. What is a view? The times that is it being watched, you know? The more it is, the more better the video is. Like, you know, when you look at mm -hmm. the, when you open the YouTube and you see the first video that comes up with the maximum number, you know? Yeah, total views, obviously. That's the number they put out there. So why don't we, why don't, but why don't we then, instead of, you know, uh, minutes watched, why don't we have total views? Why aren't we counting total views for Goldsville? Maybe they turn it off right away. A view is actually only counted by making it a certain way through the video. It doesn't necessarily indicate that somebody's actually watched it. So what does that mean? It means when they turn on it, like, and they stop watching. Maybe they stop minute watching and they just don't like that thing. So that's where we get into this minutes watched. And I'm going to increase our. Come on, Internet. Great. Google's having issues today. Yeah? Yeah. Well, it's got a way I of knowing when I'm trying to. Use a different browser. Well, don't they do maintenance on YouTube on Wednesdays? <laughs> Pretty sure they do. No, they wouldn't. They I mean, some of it, but we actually get, when we click minutes watched, we can see the total volume of minutes watched, and then other ways inside of here. And here's just views. What are we doing? 
Yeah, it looks like they are playing with it. Okay. I told you. You are. You did tell me. Thank you. Google is a little broken today. Okay. Um, any other questions on this guy? So one of the things we can do is obviously tell our team which videos are being watched so we can create more, again, of the types of content that people actually watch. And when YouTube's not broken, you can actually look in the middle of a video to see how it's performing to say when do people have, actually stop watching it. I have that up on here. Do you? Yeah, it works I, for me. And you went to the estimated minutes watched, right? I went through audience retention. Audience retention, thanks. Oh, of course, thanks. Of course. Of course. Of course. There it is. There's my happy graph. Um, here's our audience retention. So we can tell, right, a view would only be over here. But now we can see, as somebody goes through this video, where the drop off is. And we're looking at a small sample size, so this isn't that impressive. Like no one finished the video? Not entirely true. Mm -hmm. If I increase our date range and I do lifetime. Over the course of a lifetime, people did, in fact, finish, right? We had a small sample size. And now, instead, I've done the entire life of the video. We have a, a bit of a better trend. And we can tell where people are dropping off. And then relative audience retention, as we've covered before. Now they've got the benchmark, right? So maybe oh, we don't uh, understand the, we have too small a sample size, for example. Or you know, we can't tell because of the type of content we have. We can see, on average, for videos this length, where do people um, fall as far as distribution of all videos on YouTube? And so we start off below average here, right? We want to be um, all videos are above average on uh, Globesville, of course. And we see how we ebb and flow based on when people stop watching. This was the overall average, so we can get that benchmark. Does YouTube Analytics allow tracking of click through and time of day? Does Google Analytics allow YouTube Analytics? Does YouTube time of day? I actually don't think so. I don't it does think do so. Click it does do the click throughs and activity on it. So that. Oh, I have four viewers. That's pretty good. Does that go in here? What would a click through mean on YouTube anyway? You want to explain that? I don't know. Let me ask the, the viewer. Annotations. Exactly. What's an annotation? It's those words that are pop up on the video. When you're watching a video, you can click on and go to another video or someone else's website. It's like, watch our local minute tutorial here, and you click on it, and it goes to the local minute tutorial. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So you can tell those uh, definitely in Google Analytics. Here, you can tell where people are actually watching from. So not necessarily time of day, but you can tell where people are watching from. And the one I really care about, actually, is the external website and uh, obviously on YouTube itself. Um, and so, and the external website, what does that mean? Where they got the link from? Where they came With from? Tracing. So on here, the external website. Tracing. We actually get a breakdown of where people in fact watch the video. Because with YouTube, you can embed it. And so here we have Facebook, Globesville. And we realize, oh my gosh, people are actually watching things on Facebook and Globesville. So when we make a post on Globesville with a video embedded, you see that we can actually get these viewer counts aggregated together. <coughs> and so this is a large way we are actually going to build our audience as we build our website. Did we make posts, by the way? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. OK. Likes Questions on happen. this. Unfortunately, we don't. Here's where the annotations would be. And we have. Well, if you look at some of the older Google <laughs> Minutes, they're, at, they're all annotated. All right, great. So you can look through those. But. Yeah. So we could tell if somebody clicked on something in the active video. While something's going on, there's an overlay. Somebody clicks, we can track it. Engagement. Did they make eye contact with us? OK. Any other questions on YouTube? Cool. 
onto Google Analytics. And I will increase the size of this so we can see. So pretty. Oh, internet. <laughs> Hopefully we can see this. So here we have our website, globesville.com. Analytics is running on it, which means that there's a little tracker on every single page that's going on telling us things like, did somebody just come from Facebook? Did somebody come from you know, New York? It's looking at geography. It's looking at time on site. Um, it's basically tracking your online behavior. And it tells us this over time. So there's a lot of information being stored every single day. We can look at the types of content. But first, I want to make sure we understand the basics here. Um, what is a visit? Anybody? How many people, how many people went? Um, OK, well, what is unique visits then? How many different people came to the website? Is I thought you said visits were a number of people. Because well, I can go to the website on my computer 15 times but it's only one computer. You want different computers coming to the website. So it's measuring unique IPs and devices for unique visitors. So if we wanted to know how many unique individual people, as far as Google can tell, which number would you use? Unique visitors. And that's more of the standard that's coming. So when say, uh, let's say for a website, they're like, oh, what are your uniques? They're asking for what are your monthly unique visitors as a standard way of phrasing that. What are page views? What do you think page views are? How many people view a certain amount of pages? Right, it's the total count of the individual pages on the site. How many new pages that were actually loaded? And um, is it one page view per person? Uh, if they stop on one page. If they only go to one page, yes. But technically, you could be on there rifling through a bunch of pages, and suddenly you've got a whole bunch of page views. Page views back in the 90s were called hits. People used to be like, I get like 10,000 hits. My mom like F5, 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 F5. And you can make this number go really high up and make yourself seem important. Um, fortunately, we have a bit more uh, data behind it now. So those are page views. Pages per visit is uh, what it sounds like. It's uh, a proxy for engagement, though, because it's the total page uh, pages over uh, page views over visits, sorry, that give you this sort of um, shorthand engagement number. And so 4.3 is like, on average, 4.3 um, 4 pages are viewed by individual people. And if that number went up, would we be happy or sad? Happy. Happy. Why would we be happy? Because more people are viewing the website and all its pages. Again, this is a proxy for engagement. There's more people looking through it. What about average visit duration? What is that number? How long they spent on it. How long they spent on the site. OK. Uh, and what is bounce rate? <laughs> Greg, what do you think bounce rate is? Bounce rate is when they come. It's how many people come to the website and then leave immediately. 10% mm -hmm. of the people that come to the website immediately leave the website. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So let's say this room is a website, uh, a single page on the website. And somebody, like Andre, runs in, looks around, says, oh god, I don't want to be here at all, and runs away. Bounce rate, right? He just bounced out of the room. And if he only goes to one page, right, our one page here, which could be a home page, could be a sub-landing page, yeah. only one page, and he leaves, then bounce rate of you know 100% if he's the only person that came to our site. Uh, if our bounce rate was higher, would we be happy or sad? Sad. Sad. Why would we, why would we be sad? Because so many people bounce back. <laughs> and exactly. no one found it interesting. That's right. It's a sort of proxy for engagement again, a quality metric that says, if this number is high, that means people don't like your stuff. They are ending up on the wrong page for some reason. So let me go back to uh, the average visit duration. If somebody like Andre came in and only went to one page and then left, what would the time on site be for that? Let's say he stayed for 10 seconds, looked around the room, then left. What would, what would our time on site be for, for Andre? Raise your hand if you think it is 10 seconds. Raise your hand if you don't know what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> Thank you for being honest. Raise your hand if you think it's zero. Okay. Why do you think it's zero? Because I, I don't think the number would count, like you said 10 seconds, I don't think it really counts as the full 10 seconds for just the one person. It would have to be like an overall for a certain amount of, for like more people. Mm. So I think it's like an average. So let's say a um, hundred Andre clones, an army of Andre, walked in, everyone came in for 10 seconds, looked around, and because he's a clone, they all do the same thing, and they all leave. Look at a movie. So that visit was 19, cents, uh, 19 seconds. So that was a visit of 19 seconds. And he came in before for 10 seconds. And he only went to one page. What do you think now? What would his, uh, what would the time on site be? I think it would count a little bit more. Okay, so you're on team a little bit more. You're still looking at me confused. What do you think? How much time? What is Andre's time on site? Or this is a website. We just had two visits from Andre. I don't know. Don't know. Uh, I guess it would be 30 seconds. About 30 seconds. Okay, you're aggregating. But it's an average, so it'd probably be less than 30 seconds because he spent 19 seconds and 10 seconds respectively. So we average so those together. It's an average, right? It's average visit duration, not a cumulative time. So you think it would be a number between there? What do you think? Don, what do you think? I'm doing something else. What do you think? Okay, so again, it's an average. So if it was anything, it would be less than average. It would be somewhere between 10 seconds and 19 seconds. The actual truth is zero seconds. If Andre only goes to one page, now this confuses the crap out of a lot of people. If Andre only goes to one page on our site and then leaves, that is technically counted as zero seconds. Because Google, and its infinite wisdom, needs to have a second interaction to say, oh, he was here, and then he was here, that took this much time. And if it never hears that second event, if that never happens, and he just wanders off and goes to you know, Facebook or what have you, then it never tracks that time. So this is a little misleading. And I go on and on and on about this because many people will only stop with this uh, initial understanding of Google Analytics. And so this is just to whet your appetite a little bit about how we can understand a little bit deeper. But seeing that in this average visit duration, if I factor out people that bounce that number, what do you think will happen to it? Will it go up? Will it go down? Will it stay the same? All right, raise your hand if you think it will stay the same. OK, raise your hand if you think it will go down. Can you repeat the question? Sure. So if I factor out the Andres out of our average visit duration, the people that came to one page and leave, and we said, Google obviously doesn't count those, will this number go up, stay the same, or go down? Stay the same. Stay the same. Stay the same. Anybody for a team, it will go up? Drum roll, let's see if it went up, down, or stayed the same. What happened? It went up. What does that mean? That means you lie to us, George. I lied to you all. That means that to get a true sense of the people that stayed, because Google factors in zeros into our average, one of the many reasons I hate averages, they're very misleading, because they average in things like zeros. If Bill Gates walked into this room, we would all be average millionaires. And then we could all retire on an island somewhere together and learn about analytics, finally undisturbed. <laughs> but that's not the case. If we filter out, we realize that we, we can get to a truer answer of what's going on on our websites. So kudos to all of you who got that right. Bravo. How do you factor in zeros? It's an average. So it's a weighted average, meaning that here are you know, 50 zeros visits of time on site. Here are uh, 100 people that spent 30 seconds. Here are 
50 people that spent Command. this and it, all of it averaged together as a weighted average. Very misleading. OK. Wait, so I have a question. Of course. So if someone went to like our Glowtool homepage and just watched the stream on the homepage for 15 minutes, that still counts as nothing? What do you guys think? Yep. Nothing. But they spent 15 minutes. What the hell? Yep. Sucks. They have to go to at least one page. One other page. Two pages to get at least some time on site. So that's frustrating. But we also have the YouTube analytics. So we can tell the minutes watched, which is what we care about. And so we kind of we make up for it there. Frustrating, though. Yeah. It's like point A and B, right? Exactly. One, two, yes. Yes. OK. I'm going to show us a couple more things just to show us how creepy this is. Uh, we have desktop, mobile, and tablet. We can tell who is looking at our site, and we can tell how they're performing. And so for desktop versus mobile, we can go across and say, at the high level, they've got acquisition, behavior, and conversions. Acquisition is how we got them, total amount, the behavior, what they did. And then we'll talk about conversions later. But here for acquisition, we've got the total people. And we can see that about 20% of our traffic is actually mobile. Very interesting. This number is increasing over time, not decreasing. And then we can see how people perform based on which device they have. And so we can see a bounce rate of 21% versus 7%. Comparing our desktop versus mobile, is this is a uh, was this a good thing or a bad thing? 20% bounce rate versus 7%. What does that tell us? What is something that, that tells us about our desktop versus mobile experience? That it's not good for the small screen. I mean, people are on the map really fast when it comes to mobile. The screen, people don't remember there's a small screen. So. I do remember that. And so by the fact that we can tell that this is about 14% you know, higher, I would like to see this probably closer to 5 to 10%. It always, of course, depends on the type of site. Mobile will always have a higher bounce rate, I'm willing to say, on average. Will always have a higher bounce rate than desktop. The question is by how much. And we can see if something is broken when you're doing your you know, analyst work. This is a quick thing. You can go on to any site and say, hey, can I look at your analytics? And then you can say, look, what is it costing you not to have a mobile optimized site? Well, it's 2x, right? Twice as many people are bouncing meaning leaving your site, pulling an Andre, as we like to say in the industry, pulling an Andre on a mobile device. Keep in mind here, though, before you draw conclusions like this, before Donnie pulls out his hair, Lord knows he can't afford too much more, we've got a very small sample size. It's a receded hairline. Don't worry, bud. Uh, the sample size is really See if you make it to the parking lot. Day. Thank you very much. See if you make it to the parking lot. See. Just see if you do that. Okay? Just leave the camera running. <laughs> yeah, you'll be, you'll be the, the sample the size here is really small, so careful about drawing conclusions from small sample sizes. Uh, do you understand what that means? Right. We don't talk to enough people, and suddenly we can have skewed data, skewed averages. So what I can do up here in the top right is adjust our date range. Yay! And I can make it for an entire year's worth of data. And now we've got a lot more to look at. We've got a stronger sample size. What happened to our bounce rate? Nice. Is this as big a burning issue? Does Donnie have to tear out his hair? Why not? Why does Donnie get to keep his hair? Because he's graduating in May. <laughs> That's what he thinks. <laughs> Why not? Mobile well, I thought you said we had. To, I thought you said we had a problem. You just now said that mobile will always have more bounce rate, and it's not. It doesn't look that big number. It's what is the difference now? No, it's small number. It's just three percent. It's like three percent. This is actually a fantastic site, and it's all because we had the wrong sample size. It's a little bit skewed. We had a very small sample size, and it could have led to a misleading bit of data. I couldn't have asked for it, actually a better example than this. I didn't think it would be that closer. It's as though I looked it up beforehand. Weird. <laughs> so every few years, there's always this huge push to design your site a certain way because it works best with whatever's going on in the world at that time. Yeah. So what sort of site design works best with Google Analytics? So are you talking about the like sort of single page scrolling 
um, style that's come into vogue as of late? The HTML5, do we call that parallax? Or? It's not parallax unless there's moving elements on it, like yeah. you know, fixed backgrounds and stuff. But so this one page. Are you yeah. familiar with the scrolling sites? Click on a thing, it scrolls down to a different part on the page. Yeah. Ooh, 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 ooh. I have an example. Ooh. Great. Ooh. So if you're asking for, there's always, um, there's a lot of trends that will come up time and time again. The scrolling sites are generally good for you know brochure type sites. I'm here to sell you a service. Buy this widget. It's really great. About yeah. pricing. Oh, really? Click the buttons. Fine. <laughs> Click the buttons. Go. Click them. Click the buttons. Hold on to your buttons. Hold on to your buttons. All right. So I'm clicking buttons, and hopefully this works. Hopefully it works. It doesn't work. What button did you click? All right. The freaking clicker. I'll click this button. Yeah, click that button. Oh. Don't click those buttons. The ones on the left. Where am I clicking? These the ones buttons. On the left, the left, yeah. See that? In the next one. Yeah. There we go. There you go. So as I click, this is a style, very slick, mind you. I don't like it. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I would hate that website, and I would move off of it. <laughs> That's um, speaking from the ad perspective. So the elements that are great about this, it is uh, responsive. It loads very quickly because once it's loaded once, you can like interact with the entire site. On the downside, this really sucks for SEO, search engine optimization. This is one page. So a little Google bot comes along and says, look at all this, mush it all together, and there's your page, as opposed to having unique pages, which serve much better for optimized search. Right? He's not going to have a, whoops, maybe you went too far type of content show up on a Google search. It'll all be aggregated together. And inside of Google Analytics, you get one page. So my experience of just coming to one page would show a bounce, which means my time on site would be Zero. Zero. I'd have a very skewed idea of what's going on. Now, if Donnie were super clever and he wanted bonus points, he could add what are known as event tracking or page view tracking, where you sort of fake a page view. And then you have to do that in code. So bonus points to you if you want to do that. <laughs> but no matter what, there's going to be uh, inevitable trends in uh, web design. And what you want to always be doing is coming back to logically saying, what do the data say? And am I just following a trend for the sake of having a cool scrolly site? Or does this actually serve the purpose I, you know, I, I really want? Which is to, in that case, the single scrolling site. I'm interested in selling a product and telling a story very, very quickly. And I'm not trying to build up you know, a knowledge base, a content farm, a you know, sort of resource center. Any other questions? I think I've covered a whole bunch. So in summary, we gather our information. We realize that every single freaking thing has a dashboard. And we realize that data analyst is one of the fastest growing things on the LinkedIn for people searching for, how do we make sense of all of these freaking dashboards? I don't have time. When we're gathering, just reporting numbers is great until we want to dive in and say, what the heck happened? We had 958 in one week. Let's do more of what works. Well, how do we do that? We go through our data process, which is gather, analyze, asking questions, gaining insights, and then taking action. If you're starting a company, joining whatever it may be, there's no way that this process won't help you do better at that job and understand what's going on from your data. Any final questions before we wrap up? Cool. Well, thank you for joining us at home. Um, this has been another Globeville lecture, and that's Andre. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Guess what? I heard you talking my name. I'm talking that junk.